Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the faculty and staff. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise and welcome the platform party for your 2017 winter commencement. Everyone, please remain standing silently for the presentation of the colors by the University of Maryland Honor Guard and for the singing of the national anthem by Ms. Raha Mirzadegan, a student in music performance accompanied by the University of Maryland Wind Ensemble and conducted by Dr. Michael Voda.
Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing. Presiding over these exercises is Dr. Wallace Lowe, President of the University of Maryland. Good evening. Welcome to the 2017 Winter Commencement Exercises of the University of Maryland. Commencement is the start of a new chapter in the lives of our graduates. This ceremony is also a wistful farewell spoken in words of endearment by the university to our graduates and by the graduates to their alma mater. We will begin with an invocation delivered by the Reverend Ruby Reese Moon of the University of Maryland Black Ministries Chaplain, and I'm pleased to say that she has served us for 24 years as a chaplain on this campus. Reverend Moon. May we bow our heads. Behold, behold, we call on our Creator to be with us as we celebrate the University of Maryland campus-wide winter commencement. We pray that President Lowe, all who administrate, perform services, those who teach, and those who learn, will continue to be enlightened with wisdom, courage, and good health. Bring commendations to our students, parents, guardians, families, and friends who have joined us this evening as our graduates journey to their next destination of success. Please bring your amazing grace for a peaceful universe, as so much pain is endured when discrimination and other acts of evil take place among our people. Guide the commencement speaker, Congressman Elijah Cummings, as he moves forward to enlighten legislature that is beneficial to all the people to America and to the world. We thank the Creator for all the blessings we receive. Amen, amen. and amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Reverend Moon, for your words of reflection. And thank you, Raha Mir, Zad Raz Raha Mir Zadigan, for your inspired rendition of our national anthem. She is a soprano with the Maryland Opera Studio. And of course, thank you to the University of Maryland Wynn Ensemble. And thank you, too, to the University Honor Guard. And seated on the front row are students who are serving as marshals this evening. They are selected by a committee of their peers and staff based upon their academic accomplishments and contributions to campus life. Will the student marshals please stand so we can thank you. Thanks. I also want to thank the faculty members, the faculty marshals, the staff who have come today to join in honoring our graduates. We also have ROTC commanders and athletic coaches and other staff. Would you please stand to be recognized?
we're here to celebrate the graduation of our students. And um, as I was getting ready, I was looking at the program and noticed that there are many speakers. And I was reminded of the time, many years ago, when I was a commencement speaker and a good friend of mine who is an Irish priest set me aside and said, you know, let me give you a piece of advice. Just remember that a speaker at commencement is sort of like, um, like the body at an old-fashioned Irish wake. They need you to have a party, but nobody expects you to say very much. <laughs> so um, I expect we will all follow that advice this evening, myself included. We shall be mercifully brief, and I'm hopeful that we can conclude this in a little bit under two hours and 10 minutes, about the length of a feature movie. Our first speaker is Barry Gossett, the Vice Chair of the University System of Maryland Board of Regents. He is a terp through and through. He bleeds red and white and black and gold. He is one of our most loyal supporters. I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Gossett. Well, in the 20 minutes that Wallace has allotted me, I think I will cut it down to maybe two minutes so that everybody can uh, stay on time. Uh, but good evening. I'm pleased to be with you both to offer my congratulations on behalf of the governing body, the University System of Maryland Board of Regents, and as a proud Terp. <clears throat> Share this occasion with your president and my friend Wallace Lowe is truly an honor. The University of Maryland College Park campus is a special place to everyone assembled here and to the whole world. It's a force for education, discovery, public service. It represents about everything that is great about public higher education. Whether you look at national rankings, research grants, public service activities, faculty accomplishments, or really student achievements, our flagship campus is one of the finest universities, not only in the USA, but in the world. President Lowe is committed to even higher new heights of excellence and greater success for our flagship. It's also a privilege to join your commencement speaker, Congressman Elijah Cummings, a man who personifies all of the best about public service. We all look forward to his address. However, the best honor is recognizing and congratulating the 2017 University of Maryland graduating class. What you have accomplished getting to this place in life's journey has taken hard work, dedication, and persistence. Your family and your friends also take pride in what you have accomplished. They have shared in your sacrifice and certainly share in your success today. Coupling the strong traits of great character, honesty, and integrity learned from your family and teachers, coupled with your Maryland education, has prepared you for future accomplishment and achievement. Go forward, do great things, but remain loyal to your alma mater, the University of Maryland. My congratulations to each and every one of you. Have a great holiday season, and go Terps! Thank you, Regent Gossett. Now, I would like to introduce the members of the platform party who are seated behind me. I would ask that you please stand when I call, when I call your name, and I will ask the audience to please please withhold your applause until I have introduced everybody or else we'll be here all night. <laughs> you already know Barry Gossett. And we have another member of the Board of Regents. She is new. She is an attorney from Baltimore, Katrina Dennis. By the way, I should say she's a fantastic lawyer. And, and I have to say that because I'm a lawyer too. But you should know the difference between her and me. She's a real lawyer. I'm a public interest lawyer. It's in the public interest that I don't practice law. <laughs> Will Shorter. Will Shorter is the student member on the Board of Regents. He is a student at the University of Baltimore, majoring in interdisciplinary studies. And I've never met a regent who worked so hard as this student. Thank you for your service. Marianne Ranking, Senior Vice President and Provost, and she is a biologist. Oh, there you are. 
Linda Clement, Vice President for Student Affairs, and she has served at this university for 33 years. Linda. I'm here. Oh, you're there. Good. Carlo Colella, Vice President for Administration and Finance. He is a civil engineer, and he is also a TERP, and he's been here for over 25 years. Jackie Lewis. And she may be the newest member. She's Vice President for University Relations. And she's been here for, I think, three or four months. Jackie, there you are, from the University of Iowa. She came. Lori Locasio, also a new member. She's been here for about four months. She's the Vice President for Research. She's a toxicologist and also a bioengineer. And for a long time, she held a very high position at the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. Mike Potarella. Another real lawyer, he's our general counsel and vice president. Joanne Boffman, senior vice president, uh, vice chancellor, I'm sorry, for academic and student affairs at the University System of Maryland. And you are a biologist, am I correct? Medical geneticist. A medical geneticist. Well, they're almost the same thing. <laughs> Damon Evans, our acting athletic director, as you know, he was a star football player at Georgia, and he was before here uh, athletic director at Georgia. Joe Seligman, he's also relatively new. He's the Associate Vice President for Communication, and uh, we're really pleased to have him. Kirk Bell, President of the University of Maryland Alumni Association. There you are. Thank you for coming. Amy Eichhorst, the Director of our Maryland Alumni Association. And you've been here five years or so, right? A.J. Pruitt, he's a senior majoring in government and politics, and he is the president of the undergraduate student government. And I predict that he and uh, Will Shorter, someday you will see them as elected officials in the state. That's my fearless prediction. Shu Han. A graduate student who's getting his PhD in public policy, and he will introduce our commencement speaker. Dan Falvey, a professor of chemistry, he's the chair of the University Senate. Uh, here we have very strong shared governance, and the University Senate is the way that we express our norms of academic democracy. And our senior marshals are Marsha Gunsler Stevens, who's the director of the Stamp Union, and Sherry Parts, who's an associate dean of arts and humanities. They're in the back row there. Wave at the crowd. <laughs> Thank you. And the university marshal is Martha Nell Smith. She's a professor of English and probably the world's authority on the poetry of Emily Dickinson. What does that mean? That means that I believe, or she's reputed to know, by memory, all 1,700 poems by Emily Dickinson. And then we have our university deans. Now, it's not that they're not important. It's just that we'll be here all night. So they will introduce them. Why don't you all stand up? And later in the program, they will each introduce themselves individually. So you may now join me in a round of applause. Please be seated. Now, at each commencement, we have a committee of students uh, select a fellow student to be the speaker. And this evening, we have the pleasure of hearing from Rachel Smith. Rachel, where are you? Why didn't you come up here? Uh, Rachel, before I introduce you, I know that your parents are here, mm -hmm. Bruce and Bruce Smith, Jesse Colt. Kutchie. Kutchie and your brother, John Smith. Mm -hmm. All right, stand up. Welcome. So Rachel comes to us with a prophetic passion for justice. She just doesn't choose one of the existing majors. She creates her own major, and it combines Espanol, Spanish, immigration, and ethnic studies. Please welcome Rachel Smith.
Thank you, President Lowe, and thank you to the administration, faculty, and staff at the University of Maryland, and to the Maryland community for celebrating our graduation. I feel honored to be on this stage and to speak to you tonight. To my fearless fellow graduates, congratulations. It was a long and not always easy journey to get here. Most of us can recall the all-nighters in McKeldin Library, arguing with group partners at 11.30 at night, the day before our projects were due, through the courses we thought we'd never finish. We worked hard to make it to graduation. To our parents, families, and everyone who has fought hard for us to be here now, thank you for being by our side since day one, watching and helping us grow into the people we are today. You made enormous emotional and financial sacrifices for our education. Sometimes, you even gave up your own dreams for ours. As a Maryland student, I worked with parents who have also fought hard and sacrificed for the dreams of their children. This was part of the major I created, Immigration and Ethnic Studies. Of all my experiences in this major, the most powerful ones have been traveling to immigration detention centers in Texas and Pennsylvania, where I worked with lawyers on the legal cases of families seeking asylum in the United States. These families came from all over the world, fleeing from unimaginable violence in their home countries. They arrive at our borders and only ask for one simple thing, protection, a safe future for their children. A father once described to me how he carried his little five-year-old daughter on his shoulders for hundreds of miles so she could have a chance at a better life and grow up in a country where her life is not in danger. I look at my own parents and I know they would have undertaken the same journey for me. Every parent in this room would. When I met with parents in immigration detention centers while I was working as a volunteer, they often told me how they worry that all of their sacrifices could be in vain if they are turned around and sent back to the dangerous situations they fled. They feel like everything they have fought for could be gone. To some degree, it is a feeling all of us have had before. We come to seemingly insurmountable roadblocks in our education, careers, and lives when we feel like all we have fought for could crumble down. And I'll repeat the same words to you that I tell these families all the time. Nunca dejen de luchar. Never stop fighting. Never stop fighting for your family, for others, and for yourself. What inspires me in these families is their perseverance. One story in particular that has stuck with me is that of Alejandra. Alejandra is a young mother of a four-year-old daughter. Her daughter reminds me of many four-year-old girls. She even loves Elsa from the Frozen movie. 
Alejandra brought her daughter to the United States after fleeing from violence in El Salvador and surviving a dangerous journey through Mexico. After talking with her for a few minutes, I told her I realized that we both were born in the same year. She looked at me as if she could not possibly believe we could be in the same moment of our lives. There she was, at 20 years old, raising her child in a detention center in an unfamiliar country. She's one of the most fearless women I've ever met. And here I was, at 20, about to graduate from a university that has encouraged me to pursue fearless ideas. My fearless idea is to use my education to help make our legal system and our country more welcoming for families like Alejandra's. I am called to use my education to make our country the one I envision, where survivors of persecution find safe haven, where families are never separated by their legal statuses, and where your birthplace does not determine the opportunities available to you. As young people with the privilege of a Maryland education, we are called upon to be well-informed global citizens. Each one of us has a fearless idea that innovates, that inspires, that changes our cities, our country, and our world. Every day on this campus, I meet students who are already using what they've learned here at Maryland to improve communities around the world. Whether advocating for change through the Maryland State Legislature or conducting research in South Asia or Latin America. I meet Terps who are working to raise the minimum wage, to empower women and girls, to advance racial justice, and to combat climate change. In my fields, I often meet people who are having an impact on public policy and who advocate for the vulnerable and less fortunate. I love it when I find out later that they were students at the University of Maryland. It shows that our mission to do good does not end when we leave this campus. We worked hard to earn our degrees, but the hard work is not over. It's just beginning, but it's good work, it's important work, and it's necessary work. No matter what field you are going into, you have the opportunity to make the world more just, more sustainable, safer, freer, and more equitable. We have the opportunity to help create the country and world that we envision. We have the opportunity to use our education to do good. I hope you'll join me in doing just that. Thank you and congratulations to the fearless class of 2017. Thank you, Rachel. I was deeply moved by your remarks. I can relate to the stories you told because it brought back memories of my own youth when I came here as an immigrant at the age of 15, a Latasian, Latino Asian, with no money, no friends or family, not speaking English. And the stories you told this evening and your commitment to social change and social justice resonated greatly with me. 
Now, I know I'm paraphrasing what you said, but you called your classmates, you called yourself to use your education, correct? To use your education in order to envision the country that you want. You know, as you were saying that, it reminded me of, of uh, a famous phrase by the poet Langston Hughes of the Harlem Renaissance. And he said something to the effect that um, America, America is the dream that dreamers dream. Rachel, the American dream lives in you. Your passion to do good, to, gi to give back, to serve the community. America is great because people like you make it great by your service and by doing good. Thank you, Rachel. From impassioned dreaming, we now are thrilled to welcome the acclaimed Maryland Gospel Choir, acclaimed for their impassioned rhythmic singing. These are students, please come forward. These are students from all disciplines. They are directed by Mitchell Fleming. And the lead soloist tonight is Caitlin Barnes, a student in computer science. And this group of students, uh, not this particular group, but the Maryland Gospel Choir has been performing for the past 43 years at the University of Maryland. Thank you for being here tonight. Angels are ringing them bells. I hear a angel. 
Thank you, Maryland Gospel Choir. You certainly have lifted our spirits with hope and joy with your performance of Rocking Jerusalem. Now I call on Xu Han, graduate student in public policy. Will you come up? He is uh, pursuing a PhD and he he was a member of the committee that uh, decided on the commencement speaker, and he is here to introduce our speaker. Thank you, President Lowe. Good evening. It's my honor to introduce our speaker, Congressman Elia Cummings, who represents Maryland's seven districts. Like many of us here today, Congressman Cumming has experienced the transformative power of education. As a child of former sharecroppers whose education had after fourth grades, he has leased by his father Robert Cummings' words, I quote, Son, you go to school to get blessed so that you can bless, end quote. Throughout his long career from Maryland General Assembly to the U.S. Congress, he has been a forceful advocate for education, striving to improve both its access and quality. Congressman Kongin is also the champion of civil rights. He has worked to uplift and empower peoples, especially those on the margins of society. To addressing the increasing inequality in the nations, he and Senator Elizabeth Warren launched the Middle Class Prosperity Project. As a ranking member of the House Committee's on Oversight and Government Reform, he had achieved the extent of his colleague. Go to great lengths to reaching across the widening aisle. Born and raised in Baltimore, he got his bachelor's degree in political science from Howard University and law degree from University of Maryland, Baltimore. Twelve universities across the nation had awarded him the honorable daughter degree. So will we today. You know, there's no, as Congressman himself noticed, that there's no copy usually of his speech because as he speaks, it's usually from his heart. So I'm honored to introduce you, Congressman Laya Kamin. Thank you, Mr. Hahn, for your very kind words and introduction and congratulations on your academic success. Good evening, everyone. Oh, come on now. We can do better than that. Good evening, everyone. I am very uh, pleased to join you this wonderful evening, especially since my wife, Dr. Myra Rocky Moore Cummings, and my daughters, Adia and Jennifer Cummings, are here uh, to give me support. Allow me to commend our world-class university's president, Dr. Wallace Lowe, and Proverbs Mary Ann Rankin, and all of the distinguished and hard-working faculty and staff who have made this evening possible, and to the family of Lieutenant Richard Collins. Family, I will have some personal thoughts to share with you later in the proceedings. You know, 
You know, it's been, graduates, we all know that we seldom achieve anything by ourselves. So please join me in thanking your family and friends, your teachers, and all the uh, other people who have stood by you and helped you to reach this graduation stage. I know, I know. You know the ones that you borrowed the money from that you're not going to pay back? <laughs> Amen. I tell you, I'm a father. I know, I know what it's about. And graduates, uh, during these ceremonies, go ahead, give them a hand, please. I think Rachel uh, said it best. Uh, parents simply want what is best for their children. And they will give their blood, their sweat, and their tears to make that happen. And so for them, this is a great, great day, just as it is for you. Graduates, during these uh, ceremonies, it's customary to offer the graduating class some advice. But first, I'd like to pose a question. It was a question that was asked by British songwriter Cat Stevens in his top 10 hit, Oh, Very Young. In the song, he simply asked the question, Oh, very young, what will you bring us this time? You're only dancing on this earth for a short time. Oh, very young, what will you bring us this time? Graduates, you have succeeded at this great school, and now you will receive your degrees. Sharing this moment with you takes me back to a time when I was a young man sitting where you are sitting today. I hope that you will treasure your degree as I have. You have sacrificed for it, you prayed up for it, you stayed up for it. Some of you fell down, but thank God you got back up, dusted yourself off, and kept on going. You started it and you finished it. And I have stopped by here to tell you that I am so proud of each and every one of you. You are justified in taking pride in all that you have accomplished. Please join me again in giving yourselves a hand. Go ahead, give yourself a hand. Yeah, you better clap now. Some of y'all didn't think you would be here. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, I too am a proud Turpin. I received my law degree from our world-class university system in 1976. Now 40 years later, our university has seen fit to award me with an honorary degree. Uh, President Lowe, I thank the University of Maryland for this acknowledgement of my life's work. But I need to be clear about the main reason that I am so pleased to be here with you tonight. Graduates, this intimate evening gathering of your closest family members, friends, and teachers has just confirmed that you, not any of the notables joining us tonight, are the most important persons in this auditorium. You are the most important persons here tonight because you are our future. When many of us are dancing with the angels, you will have to carry on. In America, our nation has always pointed itself towards that better future and that more perfect union that we are determined to create. Our history informs us that despite periods of regression, our drive to forge the future has always ultimately prevailed. And at each stage of our national development, the critical question for us as Americans has remained the same. What kind of nation, what kind of people do we want and choose to become? This I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, is the central question that we Americans are struggling with every day, trying to answer it. What kind of nation do we want to
to become and how do we want to go about achieving that dream? Graduates, the answer to this operational question, the answer to how we achieve this better future that is at, is at the heart of our nation's vision for ourselves and for our children is why you are the most important persons in this great hall tonight. I do believe that you are the living messengers we send to a future we will never see. Let me say that again. You are the living messengers we send to a future we will never see. In a very real sense, you and the lives that you create in the years ahead will be my generation's final exam. So with your permission, I will briefly touch on a few lessons from my own life experience that hopefully will allow you and, and all of us to achieve the highest possible grade because you and generations yet unborn deserve nothing less. Please know, graduates, that your communities and state did not invest in your higher education to create followers. We got enough followers. We need some leaders. Come on now. Your families and teachers have done all that they can to prepare you to lead. I don't want to be like Marco Rubio, let me just. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I was uh, trying to be apolitical. <clears throat> I, I, I had to get that in. <clears throat> Your families and teachers have done all that they can to do, do to prepare you to lead. And I should do no less. So I'll use my brief time with you this evening to share a few insights about your futures as leaders. They are the same insights that I wish someone had shared with me when I walked down the aisle of my college graduation. My preliminary theme is that to become successful leaders, first, we must achieve success in our own lives. Hello. In our own lives, trying to lead somebody, and you, you haven't done anything in, yourself. Come on now. True leadership is a function of our growth and personal achievement as human beings. It is not the result of blind ambition. Now, graduates, many, if not most, of the well-wishers here uh, with us this evening have achieved a measure of success in their own chosen life work. And they will advise you, if they have not already done so, that their success was a consequence of several factors. One, they have constantly worked hard to improve and develop themselves. They never stopped. They've always acted on the basis of their deepest convictions and not on what was convenient at the moment in choosing their life's work, and listen to this one, in choosing their life's work, they have avoided the easy temptations. They made the choices that fed their souls, made them feel fulfilled, and brought them happiness. These are some of the character traits that provide a foundation for success, but there are more. When successful people have experienced pain in their lives, as we all do, and as we all will, and if you haven't yet, just keep on living. But when successful people have experienced pain in their lives, they have not asked the question, why did it happen to me? No, that, that, they don't have time for that. Rather, they ask the question, why did it happen for me? There's a big difference. And so I also must observe, graduates, that every successful person I've known has someone else who gave them help at a critical juncture 
in their lives. That helped reinforce them in a fundamental, a fundamental truth that applies to both individuals and societies. Most successful people have learned in the famous insight of a poet that none of us are islands entire of ourselves. Rather, we are parts of a continent, parts of the main. My own life bears witness to that truth, and with your permission, I will take a few moments to explain. I spent my earliest years living in a small, rented South Baltimore row house. They were in the 1950s, and we lived near Fort McHenry, where the Star Spangled Banner, Banner still waves. Every morning, Dr. Lowe and my classroom, we would stand up and put our little hands up to our hearts after singing a religious song, and we would pledge allegiance to the flag. And I must tell you, though, that I had to question whether those inspiring words, liberty and justice for all, included me. As a little boy, when I went to the eight-room eight room schoolhouse, which was all African-American, and about three blocks away was an all-white schoolhouse with 50 rooms. My schoolhouse had no gymnasium, no auditorium, no playground, no cafeteria. And I wondered whether liberty and justice for all applied to me at eight. Our poorly equipped eight-room elementary school didn't have much, but we had strong teachers who believed in us. Because my, my parents re re received very little formal education, and they were not able to send us to school as prepared as we should have been. So I was trying to learn in what was then called the third group. Today, we would call that class special ed. One day, a counselor asked me what I wanted to become in my life. I answered that I wanted to be a lawyer, like the NAACP's Miss Juanita Jackson Mitchell, who has stood up for me as a nine-year-old and stood up for me and my friends at an all-white swimming pool in Baltimore called Riverside. That lawyer had led us over a course of seven days to integrate this Olympic-sized pool so we could swim in something better than the wading pool we have been permitted to use that was just two feet deep. I wondered whether liberty and justice for all applied to me. And so, going back to my counselor, having let him know that I was inspired by this wonderful lawyer, I told him, I said, I really want to be a lawyer. And then he asked me, he said something to me that I shall never forget. I was 11 years old or less, and I will never forget what he said. And parents, let me interject this. And you as future parents, let me interject this. It's not the deed, it's the memory. It's not the deed, it's the memory. He said to me, you want to be a lawyer? And he asked me this question, who do you think you are? How dare you think, little black boy, mother and father, less than a sixth grade education, six brothers and sisters living in a four-room house, you can never be a lawyer. Those words have haunted me all my life. They haunted me right up to this stage because I have spent my entire life answering that question, who do you think you are? I must admit that I've spent my life trying to answer it. And so graduates, those words crushed me. And I almost lost faith in myself that day. But in the months to come, good teachers like my sixth grade teachers, and thank God for good teachers. Mr. Hollis Posey listened to my dreams. 
Come on now. They believed in my potential and thought to my strength and did not judge me by my weaknesses. Meanwhile, outside of school, our local recreation leader, Captain Jim Smith, took me under his arm. And then Dr. Albert Friedman, my neighborhood pharmacist, trusted me at 14 with the greatest job you could have in the inner city, and that was being the assistant to the pharmacist, dishing out ice cream, filling prescriptions without a license, and getting paid. <laughs> and so together with my parents, they lifted me up, but they did something else. They took my dream and made it their own. So I did not give up. Kept working hard, and the day finally came when I made it out of the third group, the special education class. I went on to study and graduate from one of Baltimore's top academic high schools. Later, I would earn a Phi Beta Kappa key at Howard University, and then a law degree from this great university. And, and, and today, I'm getting a, another one, an honorary degree. <laughs> But I continue to work hard to perfect my calling, helping other people whenever I could. And when I was talking to the Collins family, oh God, when I was talking to them before I came in here, his grandfather said something that chilled my soul. He said, young Mr. Collins was so busy trying to help other people, trying to help them with their term papers, trying to help them make sure, to make sure that they graduated, that sometimes he didn't even find time to get his own done. But that's what he was all about, and that's what the American spirit is all about, only in America. And let me give you a footnote. A lot of people have taken our democracy for granted. Ladies and gentlemen, as I walk in the evening of my life, I beg you to give me the gift and generations yet unborn. Protect this democracy. Protect this democracy. I will go to my grave protecting it. Let me tell you why. A lot of people, I think, get confused, Dr. Lowe, because they have never seen other governments. They've never traveled and seen what it's like to go to other countries. And they've never been in that position where when you come back to the United States, you want to just kiss the ground. They have nothing to compare it to. Is it perfect? No. But it's the best I've seen. Let me hasten, because I want to obey Dr. Lowe's orders. <clears throat> now, graduates, I should hasten to add that I did not share the thumbnail sketch of my life to celebrate myself. Rather, I do it to encourage each of you in your own life. And that brings me to the next lesson that I joined you to share. Graduates, we applaud you tonight because you have dreamed big dreams and have made progress towards your goal. But let me give you a footnote. Do not mistake a comma for a period. <laughs> Do not. So however, from my own life experience, I must observe that you did not reach this graduation stage alone. This illustrates a fundamental truth. Our personal dreams mean nothing if they do not benefit other people. When Juanita Jackson Mitchell stood up for us as children as we were attacked at Riverside Swimming Pool, she gave us something far more important than the, the ability to cool off in some cool water. She taught us that we were United States 
citizens with rights that others had to respect and that everyday people have to stand together to protect that power and protect those rights. When Hollis Posey and those other key people in my early life encouraged me to have higher expectations of myself, they helped to set me on a course that led me to the Congress of the United States of America and for President Trump to know my name. So graduates, I would, I would not be standing before you today if I had done nothing but get some good grades. That's nice. I would not be standing here and having this conversation with you if I had accomplished nothing but success in the law. That's nice. No, I'm standing here before you because the people of my community recognize that I was simply an ordinary man called to an extraordinary mission of making life better for others. And they put their hearts, their souls, and their efforts behind helping me achieve our shared dreams. The graduates, how does this apply to you, to your own life journey? In response, I will share an important postscript to my personal journey from South Baltimore to Congress. I share this as well because it may help each of you to understand the reason why each of you has unique contributions to make to the common good and to the world. I want each of you to know that you too have something of great importance to offer to our society. When I first entered Congress, I was placed in leadership. I wondered, uh, you know, why I was there. I said, what do I have to offer? I'm just a guy who came from the inner city of Baltimore. Then in a leadership meeting one day, we began discussing the federal role of adequately funding special ed, a subject I was very familiar with. And some of my colleagues were questioning whether the money that we were spending was doing any good. That was the day, 21 years ago, that I asked to speak in the committee meeting for the very first time. And what I said was the vision and the support of good people like you, my colleagues, raised me up from special education to earn a law degree. And I informed them that I can tell you that we are doing more good with the funding for special ed than you will ever know. My friends, after I made that little speech, and you know, and I was sitting there and I was saying, Elijah, you have to speak up because you're the only one that's been in special ed in here. <laughs> you're the expert. So my friends, after I made that little speech, everyone in the room just looked at me very quietly, some of them in tears, and we agreed that there should be increased funding for millions of special education children that day. <clears throat> Graduates, please remember this. The struggles that you overcome, please remember this. The struggles that you overcome in life are what, what make each of you exceptional and prepares you to deliver your gifts to the world. Go on, you can clap on that one. <laughs> and I hope that you will use the lessons that you will learn in overcoming those obstacles as passports to helping others. The insights I've gained during my own struggles, as well as my ultimate academic success, for the unique and special contribution that I brought to the national education policy. The same I predict will be true of each and every one of you. As I noted to you a few minutes ago, I've learned that the most meaningful big dreams in our lives always involve something more than our own advancement. They involve helping someone else, and so if you take nothing else from these recollections that I have uh, been sharing with you this evening, I hope that you will remember this. What we take from others in this life will be lost when we are gone. Yet the gifts that we pass on to others will remain and may sometimes change the world. This brings me back to a lesson that I mentioned a few moments ago 
a lesson of allowing the pain of our struggles in our lives to work for us and for others and not against us. This lesson was reinforced during a recent hospital stay. As you probably know, I spent the summer in, in the hospital after having a heart procedure. 60 days. Wow, that's a long time. As some here may be aware, uh, I have long been involved in working to extend affordable health care to those in need. Let me tell you where my determination to ensure everyone has access to quality health care originated. The indifference and inhumanity with which a white doctor from South, in South Carolina long ago ignored my grandfather's heart attack and allowed him to die, fueled my own drive to challenge health disparities in my own time. The pain that I needlessly endured as a child when my family lacked the funds to take me to the dentist and drove me to support, it drove me to support extending more affordable dental care to every American child. The more than 18,000 premature deaths each year in our country that the National Institutes of Medicine informed us were the direct result of exclusions from health insurance were the voices that led me to be the first in my seat waiting to vote on the Affordable Care Act. And the pain I experienced during my recent stay in the hospital when the doctors and nurses saved my life created a fire in my soul that will not be extinguished as a nation until this nation guarantees every person health care, affordable and accessible. And so, these, and so these pains have fueled my passion to do everything within my power to create a better America, the more perfect union for which we all strive. And so graduates, I predict the same for you. In your own lives, something will happen that will hurt you or someone you love. I pray that you will overcome that pain and then allow that experience to inflame your passion to help others. This formula, tweet this, this formula of pain, passion, and purpose, pain, passion, and purpose, is the reason that we now have fewer alcohol-related deaths on our highways. The same formula, pain, passion, and purpose, is why many here tonight receive financial aid to complete your education. <clears throat> Hello. <laughs> this same formula, pain, passion, and purpose, is why this great university overcame its past practice of exclusion in its graduate schools, and why we see so many women and people of color graduating here tonight. Pain, passion, purpose. <clears throat> and so, in closing, Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your patience while I attempted to share with our graduates a little of what I have learned during three and one half decades of public service. It is my hope and prayer that many here tonight will follow the same calling. Graduates, you are our future. Our nation will be depending upon you to not be weary but to carry on. So as my last bit of encouragement towards that goal, I will leave you with some inspiring words about the vision of America that I learned from a very wise man. And uh, it didn't come from Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, no, but it came from a fellow who I met at the White House. And Dr. Lowe, President Clinton, when he was president, he used to have these uh, concerts on the White House lawn, and he would invite, you know, this particular one on a Saturday afternoon. He invited uh, uh, people like uh, Melissa Etheridge, and, and uh, I think he had the Dells, and, you know, a number of good, nice groups. Um, and then at the end of all these, Stevie Wonder and others, 
And then at the end, the president came out <clears throat> and he said these words. He said, I have just been able to secure <clears throat> the greatest singer in the world. And I, by the way, I had bought, you know, I live in the inner city. So I had bought two of my, my friends from my neighborhoods, Ray Ray and Little Bubba, with me. No, that's, that's their name. And I wanted to treat them to a White House treat. So Dr. Lowe, <clears throat> we got there. We listened to the concert. It was a wonderful concert. And then the president, when he made this announcement, we were all, you know, at the edge of our chairs saying, okay, who's it going to be? And he said, ladies and gentlemen, please meet and greet the greatest singer in the world, Garth Brooks. <laughs> Who? <clears throat> so little Bubba and Ray Bay said, hey, Congressman, you know, you, who is he? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> so then this guy comes out that I'd never heard of. And he came out with a 10-gallon hat, jeans and a plaid shirt, and some pointed toe boots. And he came out, and we decided that we were going to leave. <laughs> but then he began to sing. And I was so impressed by these words that they live in my heart. I asked the question at the beginning, oh, very young, what will you bring us this time? You're only dancing on this earth for a short time. Oh, very young, what will you bring us this time? And I think that Garth Brooks has answered that question. I was so impressed with these words that I went to Target the next day <laughs> and said, give me everything that Garth Brooks has ever produced. And I had done something that people do every day. I had prejudged him, assuming that he had nothing to say that I wanted to hear. And then he said these words, graduates, and this is the liberated future that I hope you will go forth and create. <clears throat> he writes, this ain't coming from no prophet just an ordinary man. When I close my eyes, I see the way this world shall be when we all walk hand in hand, when the last child cries for a crust of bread, when the last man dies for just the words that he said, when there is shelter over the poorest head, then we shall be free. When the last thing we notice is the color, color of one's skin, and the first thing that we look for is the beauty within. And when the skies and the oceans are clean again, then we shall be free. And when we are free to love anyone we choose, when this world's big enough for all different views, where we all can worship from our own kind of few, then we shall be free, we shall be free. And when money talks for the very last time, and nobody walks a step behind, when there's only one race and that's mankind, then we shall be free. We shall be free. We shall be free. Stand straight, walk proud, have a little faith, hold out, because we shall be free. May God bless the class of 19, of 2017. We shall be free. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman, for this inspiring speech filled with humor and passions. And as you just said a moment ago, 
What we take in line will be gone. What we pass to others as a gift will remain. On behalf of the future, the graduating class, I would like to adopt this advice and present you this gift. A frame terrapin. Thank you, Congressman Cummings. We now go to the awarding of the honorary degree. But before I do that, uh, Congressman, your wife, your daughter Jennifer, and your daughter Adia are here. And uh, Maya Cummings and daughters, where are you? Would you please stand so we can recognize you? There they are. Thank you for coming. So I ask the provost, provost ranking, if you will please read the citation, and I ask Congressman Cummings to please join me here for the award of the degree. Because he never left what he calls the inner, inner city where he was born. Because he has pursued a life of service dedicated to uplifting and empowering this community. Because he champions education and children, whom he calls the messages we send to the future. Because his colleagues in the People's House see in him the highest ideals of the institution. And because these are the values we seek to teach our students. Therefore, by the authority that the Board of Regents has delegated to me, I am pleased and proud to confer upon Congressman Elijah Eugene Cummings the honorary degree of Doctor of Public Service. Again, thank you, Congressman Cummings, for giving us the honor to honor you. Your remarks remind me to, uh, just reminded me that, uh, I'd like to suggest this to the graduating class, before you leave this campus for good, given his remarks tonight, and his vision of a common country, of protecting American democracy, I urge you to stop by the statue of Frederick Douglass in front of Hornbeek Plaza. Because there are many engravings of his sayings, of his sections of his speeches, but there is one near the statue which is very dear to me. Now, I may not remember exactly what it says, but the words of Congressman Cummings brought them back to memory. This was written by Frederick Douglass, or spoken by Frederick Douglass, oh, this is almost 150 years ago, when he said, in this composite nation of ours, there should be no high, no low, no white, no black but only a common country 
common citizenship, equal rights, and a composite destiny. And as the congressman said, you are the future. You are the ones who are going to define the common destiny of this country in the 21st century. Now, we award a posthumous honorary degree of Bachelors of Humane Letters. Richard W. Collins, Jr. and Don M. Collins, the parents of Second Lieutenant Richard Wilbur Collins III will receive the Bachelors in Humane Letters on behalf of their son. This is a fitting memorial to a young man whose life and death have touched our community so deeply. Lieutenant Collins was killed on our campus last May in a senseless and unprovoked attack. The assailant, a former University of Maryland student, has been indicted for murder and a racially motivated hate crime. Newly commissioned as an Army officer, Lieutenant Collins was just days away from graduation at Bowie State University, our neighboring and sister institution in the university system of Maryland. Both of our campuses mourn the loss of a promising life that ended far too early. For Lieutenant Collins was known for devotion to his family his faith, and our country. The pain of this loss does not abate. Last May, Lieutenant Collins's father received posthumously his son's bachelor's degree in business from Bowie State University. Today, we follow their lead with a posthumous honorary degree. The president of Bowie State University, Aminta Bro, is here. And she will join me. <laughs> and she will join me shortly in presenting the diploma to Lieutenant Collins's parents. The former and long-serving president of Bowie State University, Mickey Burnham, is also here this evening. Who's here? Thank you for coming to show his respect to the family and in solidarity with our two institutions. Together, the two campuses, we will preserve Lieutenant Collins's name in our collective memory. We will wrest meaning from this tragedy. And as Congressman Cummings put it so well, pain, action, purpose. As members of the University System of Maryland, our campuses are family. This tragedy has united us in grief and in acts of healing. President Bo and I are resolved to promote academic collaborations that will benefit both of our campuses. This is an example 
an example of action that Congressman Cummings has talked about. In this spirit, we are also resolved to counteract the tide of violence and hate that would cleave our campuses and our nation in these fraught times. We reaffirm the core values that define us as a university and as a democracy, respect for human dignity, diversity and inclusion, civil rights, equal rights, and civic responsibilities. Our, current, our common efforts and actions can help unify and strengthen our respective campuses. In the words of the psalmist, I will lift my eyes to the hills. From whence cometh my help? We, do, we draw strength from our deepest values. We will continue to move forward. Beyond the hills of grief and sorrow, on our journey of healing, hope, and deliverance, now and forevermore. President Bro, would you please join me on the podium for your remarks? Thank you, and good evening. Congratulations to Congressman Cummings on receiving your honorary degree this evening, and thank you for continuing to fight the battle for civil rights in our country. I want to thank President Lowe for the invitation to join in this ceremony this evening. And good evening to the members of the Board of Regents and to the special guests joined here this evening as well as a special congratulations to the graduates and to the family and friends on this occasion that marks a milestone for your students. I bring greetings from Bowie State University, a sister institution in the University System of Maryland that is home to 6,100 students, 30,000 alumni, and over 400 members of the faculty and staff. We are known for many strengths, including our history, as the first historically black institution of higher learning in the state of Maryland. We are known as well for outstanding academic programs in the liberal arts and the STEM areas. But today, we are increasingly more diverse with students from many races, ethnicities, and cultures who hail from 19 states and 20 foreign countries. We respect and honor our legacy as the first historically black university in the state of Maryland. While we embrace and honor the common values we share as a community, including the valuing of diversity and inclusion. What many learn and experience when they first visit our campus is that BSU is also known for its nurturing and tight-knit community our tight-knit community of learners. And so, when we experience the sudden and tragic loss by a single act of violence of our dearly beloved member of the BSU community, Second Lieutenant Richard Collins III, the loss to his family was felt deeply across our community. Lieutenant Collins has been described by all who knew him as an exceptional young man. He would have received his degree this past May following his commissioning into the U.S. Army. His professor of military science described him as a quiet yet outgoing and as an, as an engaging young man of good character, good and strong character who received the highest test scores in the program and earned the one airborne slot per year and his jump wings. His fellow cadets described him as funny, brilliant, and kind. To them, he was a friend. He was a mentor, a leader, and a true role model. I want to extend my deepest gratitude and acknowledgement to Dr. Lowe 
and the University of Maryland System Universities for taking time out at the beginning of this academic year in August to remember Lieutenant Richard Collins III for a moment of re reflection across the system and in assuring that those who seek to, to divide our community will not have their way. For on that day of reflection back on August 30th at 12.05, we stood together as we stand united today as one community to honor the life and achievement of our student. Bowie State posthumously conferred a Bachelor of Arts degree in Business Administration upon Second Lieutenant Richard Collins III at our May commencement ceremony. And I am honored to be here today to join with the University of Maryland College community, Dr. Lowe and the Board of Regents in honoring the memory of Second Lieutenant Richard Collins III with the awarding of the honorary degree from the University of Maryland College Park. Attending the ceremony today are members of Lieutenant Collins' family, his mother Dawn and his father Richard II, and his sister Robin as well. They are joined by friends along with the Bulldog ROTC Battalion Commander at Bowie State University, Lieutenant Colonel Joel Thomas, and members of the Bowie State University Administration. To the Collins family, thank you for sharing your remarkable son with us. He has left an indelible mark at Bowie State University and with those he met along life's journey. Trust that he will ensure that we will ensure that Lieutenant Richard Collins III will be remembered and his legacy as an outstanding student dedicated to his country and committed to improving the lives of others will serve as an inspiration for future graduates. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please let us recognize the Collins family at this time. Thank you, President Bro. And I know you have other staff from Bowie State who are here. Thank you all for joining us this evening. By the authority of the Board of Regents that's been delegated to me, I am honored and humbled to confer posthumously upon Richard Wilbur Collins III the degree of Bachelor of Humane Letters. President Bro, let's you and I descend and meet the parents and present it to them now, this diploma, for their acceptance on behalf of their son.
We have come to the moment you've been waiting for, the presentation for the degrees. I ask each dean to step forward one at a time. Please introduce yourself, and of course, please introduce your college. Dr. Lowe, thank you. My name is Craig Beruti. I'm Dean of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources, and I would ask our candidates from that college to please stand and be recognized. I had a, uh, a script all planned to speak to you and to give you all sorts of words of advice, but you've really received those words today this evening from Rachel and from Congressman Cummings. It's been an inspiring evening. It's one that certainly has been very solemn as well. I challenge you to take the tools that you've learned and to be able to adapt those to eliminate hunger, to improve the quality of life of those around you, to protect our natural resources, and to do good. Godspeed to all of you. I'm Sonia Hurd and I'm the Dean of the School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. So will the candidates from our School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation please stand and be very, very happy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Our graduates. Thank you. Our graduates are innovators who seek to improve the built environment. Put differently, they strive to make the world around us. And I mean this literally and not only metaphorically. They make the world around us from brick to building, from neighborhood to city and region. This mission to make the world comes with a great responsibility. Through their vision and actions, our graduates improve the public's health and quality of life. They embrace diverse cultures and contribute to a prosperous and just economy. They create beauty and they create meaning. And as true terrapins, they strive to leave only but the tiniest footprints on our planet Earth. Because, as you know, good planets are hard to find. Thank you all and be really very happy and make the world and change it for the better. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Bonnie Thornton Dill, the proud Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities. With the candidates for degrees in Arts and Humanities and all their friends, please rise. <laughs> These young people who you see standing before you are global visionaries and creative problem solvers. They have the skills and talents employers seek in the 21st century because they write well, they read critically, they listen actively, they communicate effectively, and they think creatively. They are culturally aware and linguistically adept. They are worldwide. And because they are all of these wonderful things, they have been fearless and they know that they will have, as their peers have had, a 95% placement rate as graduates. So graduates, you have a lot to be proud of. And if you are our Hugh, cheer. Congratulations. I'm Greg Ball, <clears throat> Dean of the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences. Will the 2017 graduates, what we call BSOS, please stand. <clears throat> President Lowe, based on the studies that these students have completed, they now know why economies will grow or atrophy, who will be elected to office, what causes problems with learning and memory? Why we have trouble understanding speech? Why we have ethnic conflicts? 
what the impact of culture and society are on human behavior, and how our physical environment is changed by human actions. I suggest we graduate them so that they can go into society and tell us the answers to these questions we so desperately need. Thank you all. I'm Alex Trianis, the proud dean of the Robert H. Smith School of Business. Would the graduating candidates please stand up from the Smith School? When you walk, when you walk through the uh, main entrance to the Smith School of Business, you look at a big wall in bright Maryland colors that says simply, lead fearlessly. Every day they are reminded of that and they will do so with an entrepreneurial spirit, with a global mindset, with a grit and determination and collaborative spirit that typifies Terps. And they will exemplify principled leadership not only focusing on the success of their businesses, but also on the impact of the businesses on society. Congratulations, Smith grads. Hi, my name is Jerry Wilkinson. I'm the interim dean of the College of Computer, Mathematical, and Natural Sciences. Will the candidates from the College of CMS please stand? <laughs> These students are smart, creative, and ambitious. They will stand up for science because they know evidence matters. They will use science to help solve some of the most difficult challenges facing our society today. Their knowledge gives them power to change the world. Congratulations, class of 2017. Go. Good evening. My name is Jennifer King Rice, and I am the proud dean of the College of Education. Would the candidates from the College of Education please rise and be recognized? The College of Education prepares its graduates to take on one of the most important and consequential challenges of our day, to educate the next generation of citizens not only to master the subjects of math, language arts, science, and history, but also to achieve much broader goals of contributing to the economic, social, political, and civic fabric of our communities, nation, and world. Graduates of the College of Education will be teachers, counselors, transformative leaders, policymakers, and education scholars. They're prepared to be innovators in research and practice, and they are committed to work that will foster the critical goals of social justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and improve the life opportunities and outcomes of all individuals. As Congressman Cummings so eloquently put it, Thank God for good teachers. Graduates, this is an awesome responsibility, but you are prepared to take it on. You have much to be proud of and much to look forward to. Congratulations. I am Darrell Pines, and I'm the very, very, very proud dean of the A. James Clark School of Engineering. Will the candidates of the Clark School be st please stand to be recognized? All right. I've been so inspired by the remarks of Rachel, Congressman Cummings, that I have to, I'm going to try something. I want you to repeat after me. We must, must protect, protect this, this democracy. democracy. Repeat after me. We, we must protect, protect this, this democracy. democracy. 
All right, let's hear a round of applause for them. Gra graduates, I want you to use and heed the words of Congressman Cummings. Use pain, passion, and purpose to solve today's problems. And finally, in the great words of a Nobel laureate, Obi-Wan Kenobi, may the force be with you. Go Terps! Hi, everyone. My name is Boris Lushniak, and I'm actually humbled to be the Dean of the School of Public Health. Public Health candidates, please arise. Stretch a little bit, because you got to move. Move those legs. It's all about movement. So don't forget, your mission out there is to bring good to the world. Remember the things about public health. It's about promoting health. It's about preventing disease and injury with the goal of prolonging a high-quality life. That's what your mission is. I ask you to be fearless, to go out to the world and bring good to it. Be fearless. Use words like vulnerable. Use words like entitlement. Use words like diversity. Use words like transgender. Use words like fetus. Use words like evidence-based and use words like science-based. You have been trained. You have been trained to change the world. It begins tonight. I am so proud of you and what you will bring to our world. You are the future, like the good congressman said. Do public health good. Thank you so much. Good evening, I'm Brian Butler, Senior Associate Dean of the College of Information Study, or UMD's high school. Will the graduates of the College of Information Studies please stand? There you go. There we go. The stu students, faculty, researchers, scholars at the high school study the knowledge that underlies our ability to understand, create, use and manage the information infrastructures that every one of us relies on for almost everything we do in modern life. Whether it's preserving the past so that we can learn from it, disseminating the words of wisdom in the present so we can act on them, or imagining the future so we can live in it. It is the technologies, the processes, the procedures, the designs, the information and the institutions that our graduates do as graduate students and beginning next year in our undergraduate program that make the things that the university and the graduates of this university do possible. Thank you very much, graduates. We look forward to the amazing things you'll be able to do in the future. Good evening. I'm Lucy Dalglish, Dean of the Philip Merrill College of Journalism. Will all graduates of Merrill College please stand? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the graduates of Merrill College gather facts and use words, images, videos, audio, algorithms, data, and virtual reality to tell the stories we need to be thoughtful, informed members of our democracy. These graduates do it quickly, legally, ethically, and fearlessly. Whether they are reporting on health disparities in Baltimore, imprisoned journalists in Turkey, or the opioid crisis in Maryland, Merrill College graduates know the difference between fact and fiction. They are journalists who will speak truth to power and enlighten us about those we have forgotten. Please join me in congratulating the graduates of Philip Merrill College of Journalism. Hello, I'm Bob Orr, the proud 
humbled, and excited dean of the School of Public Policy. Uh, will the graduates of the School of Public Policy please stand? So I want you all to know this is leadership in action right here. <laughs> I promise you she is not alone. Our graduates who have graduated this December uh, have all graduated, gotten jobs, and shipped out to protect our democracy, <laughs> uplift our people, all of our people, and save our world at least twice a day. Thank you very much for what you've done and what you will do to serve the public good and in the public service. Congratulations. I'm Steve Fetter, Interim Dean of the Graduate School. Will all the students receiving doctoral degrees in all colleges and schools please stand? <laughs> Congratulations on receiving the highest degree that can be awarded by the University of Maryland. Will all the students receiving master's degrees in all schools and colleges please stand? <laughs> Congratulations on your accomplishment. Good evening, I'm William Cohen, Dean for Undergraduate Studies. The Office of Undergraduate Studies runs programs that reach every student on this campus. We oversee the Honors College, College Park Scholars, the Academic Achievement Programs, Letters and Sciences, and many other offices that extend across the whole university, including the General Education Program, through which all undergraduates take classes in a variety of subject areas. Tonight, we recognize those graduates for whom the 90 majors offered at this university did not suffice. These fearless students designed their own rigorous interdisciplinary majors in the individual studies program, like our speaker, Rachel Smith. Would the bachelor degree recipients in individual studies majors please rise to be recognized? Good evening. Uh, I'm Bob Akhamizadeh, the Interim Dean of University Libraries. At the libraries, we take pride in bringing reliable and authentic information in any format to all students. We consider all of you our students. So then, would all students please rise and be recognized? <laughs> please give them a round of applause. Congratulations. Thank you, deans. And finally, the most important moment has arrived, the moment when you are officially authorized to receive your degrees. And if you were wondering what the provost and I were whispering about, we were saying, we got to cut this short. <laughs> Would all the candidates for all degrees please stand? Mr. President, in accordance with the recommendation of the faculties of the schools and colleges, and in recognition, recognition of the successful completion of all degree requirements, I request that you confer upon the candidates standing before you their various degrees.
<laughs> I am not going, she is not going to read all 49 degrees. Which Just I usually do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pleased to accept the faculty's recommendation and by the authority of the Board of Regents, I'm delighted to confer upon you the candidates, the degrees as appropriate in this case, in each case. So please join me in one final round of applause for today's graduates. You may be seated, and I call upon... Congratulations. I now, I now call on Mr. Kirk Bell, President of the University of Maryland Alumni Association Board of Governors, to welcome our graduates into the ranks of the alumni. It's a little tough act to follow there. Thank you, President Lowe. Good evening, fellow alumni. It's truly an honor for me to be here to officially welcome you, the class of 2017, into the Maryland alumni family. I feel such a sense of Maryland pride to be able to address you today at my alma mater, where I created a Terp legacy. My daughter Megan is a BSOS grad, 2016. My son Connor and Ryan are both current students, Connor a journalism major, Ryan an education major, and they are both football managers on the University of Maryland football team. Beginning today and for the rest of your life, you will be part of an amazing network of powerful, eclectic, fun, and hardworking alumni. We are more than 361,000 strong. Imagine that, imagine what we can do. Terps have risen to the highest levels of their industries, launched hugely successful companies, and made groundbreaking discoveries. Two alumni were instrumental in the Smithsonian's recently opened National Museum of American, African American History and Culture. And just last month, five of our alumni made Forbes magazine 2018 30 under 30 list, recognizing young people revolutionizing 20 industries. You too will one day leave a path of greatness for others to follow, and I fully expect you all to be on that Forbes list in a few years. You may think the fun ends when you graduate. I'm here to tell you it doesn't, right? It's a lot more fun when you're an alumni. You come back, you have a little money. But what I encourage you to do <laughs> is to stay active, right? Stay active through tailgates. And when I mean tailgates, it just doesn't mean in the parking lot. You come in and you watch the games. <laughs> go to performances. Go to happy hours. Go to career networking events. That's what the Alumni Association can do for you. Stay informed through university publications like Terp Magazine or our alumni newsletters. Stay connected with Maryland and the friends you made on campus. As you leave here, the first thing I ask you to do is to find the University of Maryland Alumni Association on Facebook and like our page. You can also follow us on Twitter at Maryland underscore alumni. And last but not least, find us on our website at alumni.umd.edu to join as a member and find events, activities, and local alumni networks to participate in. We're all over the country, not just here in College Park. Fellow graduates, display your degree proudly. Demonstrate to the world the high quality education your degree represents. In turn, 
Maryland will continue to make you proud to be a Terp. And remember, no matter where you go in life, always, always stay fearless. Congratulations and go Terps, and I'll see you at homecoming. Thank you, Kirk, and thank you for your leadership of the 340,000 alumni of the University of Maryland. The late Justice Thurgood Marshall said, none of us got to where we are solely by pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. You graduates are talented and dedicated. You work hard. We are proud of you. But nobody is entirely self-made. Somebody bent down, helped you put on your boots, loved you, supported you, encouraged you, and believed in you. Because of that person or persons, parents, relatives, friends, you are here today. So I'm going to choreograph this. First, this is, I'm speaking to the people in the stands, the parents, the relatives, the friends. Then I'm going to speak to the graduates and finally the band. First, will the parents, relatives, and friends, would you all please stand up? Will the graduates stand up and applaud them? And will the band play a salute? Thank you. Rachel. So Rachel will lead you in the long-standing tradition that recognizes your receipt of the degree. Fellow Terps, please join me in the switching of the tassel from the right to left. Can I get a drum roll, please? One, two, three. You may be seated. Congratulations. Now, we have many friends, relatives of the graduates here today. Well, all the people who are here in the audience who attended the University of Maryland, would you please stand up? All right. I would say that it's approximately one third. So what shall we do about the other two-thirds? <laughs> well, by the powers vested in me as president, I hereby appoint you honorary Terps. <laughs> and uh, so all Terps and honorary Terps, we are all Terps tonight. And I want to lead you in the... I was going to say singing of the alma mater, but I cannot carry a tune. <laughs> so I will recite the words of the alma mater, and when I raise my arm, I want you to yell Maryland so loud that the walls and the ceiling of Xfinity will shake. And please stand up for the recitation of the alma mater, and after the recitation, there will be the appropriate singing of the alma mater led by HaHa -Ha and the Maryland Wind Ensemble. Hail alma mater, hail to thee. Maryland. Steadfast in loyalty, we stand for. Maryland. Love for the black and gold, deep in our hearts we hold. Singing thy praises throughout. Maryland. Go Terps! Go! Maryland.
Please be seated. We are now coming to the conclusion of the 2017 commencement exercises. And uh, I just have a few concluding remarks. First of all, a reminder that tomorrow, smaller and more personalized um, commencement exercises are held in the different departments and colleges. You can look it up in your uh, program. And uh, these are very special occasions because you actually get to walk across the stage and shake the hand of the dean or the department chair. Uh, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's much more personalized than in Xfinity. And I just want to share with you that, you know, once upon a time I was a dean as well. And I always enjoyed it when the graduates went across the stage and I shook their hands. And several years, many years later, one alumnus came up to me and said, Dean Lowe, do you remember me? I said, um, well, tell me. When I graduated and I walked across that stage, you leaned over to me and you whispered something in my ear. And that has become the secret to my success in life. Oh, so what did I say? <laughs> move along, move along. <laughs> Since I can't have you walk across the stage here, there are too many people. What I will do is, you know, there's a pavilion, that's a small gym on the first floor. I will be there after commencement, for those who wish to stop by, I will be very happy to shake your hand, meet your parents and friends, we can take a selfie, <laughs> and if you haven't gotten one already, I'm happy to give you a turtle pin. For those of you who don't know about the turtle pins, I'm happy to give them to the parents as well. It's a little gold pin of a turtle, and um, you can't get it anywhere. You can't buy it anywhere. You can only get it from me. <laughs> it costs only 75 cents. <laughs> but because you cannot buy it from anywhere, it's, it's priceless. But if you graduates ask me for a pen, I have one request. Please do not do what a lot of your very entrepreneurial fellow students are doing. They're putting it on eBay. <laughs> and it's going for $17 the last time I saw. If you don't sell it, it might be worth much, much more money 20 years from now. <laughs> I also want to close then by sharing with you some tweets. As you know, I like to have people tweet me. I tweet them at President Lowe. I was very tempted to tweet on stage, especially during the remarks of uh, Congressman <laughs> Cullings. But I, I exercised some discipline and did not do that. But um, especially for the parents who are here, you know, it's good to hear directly from the students, to hear from them what the University of Maryland is all about, and to hear about their experiences at the University of Maryland. So I've asked for this, several of you, I'm sure you're here in this room, tweet it back. And if you allow me, let me just read some of their tweets. The inst my instructions were, describe the University of Maryland and this, or describe your experience here in seven words or less. Not seven characters, but seven words on Twitter. This is the wisdom of our students. Describe the University of Maryland. Christian, I'm not going to read your last name because I don't want to embarrass you or I want, you know, uh, respect your uh, privacy. Christian, he wrote, a community of critical thinkers. Tiara, for her, what's the University of Maryland? She asked the question, why is UMD full of excitement? Now, how are they reacting to the University of Maryland? Jesse. My life and outlook changed forever. Randall, I grew up so much here. Nicole, made me stronger mentally and intellectually. Lorena, a place 
for I never stopped learning. Sergey, I leave Maryland a better person. Pranay, fastest four years of my life. Anita, I explored, I learned, I transformed. Molly, lots of laughter, lots of learning. Christina, flew 5,000 miles for this, worth everything. She must have flown from some other country, 5,000 miles. But there were some plaintive ones, and I will conclude with them. Haley tweeted, don't make me leave, dear Wallace. <laughs> and Sarah tweeted, why are you making me graduate? <laughs> and Victor said, I'm a kid. Life's a nightmare. <laughs> and Chris, I thought, had a response, not an answer to these plaintive tweets. What he said was, rub Testudo's nose and I'll be fine. <laughs> so let me conclude by, in fact, responding to the tweets of Sarah and Haley, who don't want to leave. By quoting the immortal words of my favorite philosopher, Dr. Seuss, who wrote for children of all ages, all oh, the places you'll go you're off to great places. You're off and away. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself in any direction you choose. You are on your own. You decide where to go. Now, I know, you know, sadly, hang-ups can happen in life. There will be times when you mix your right foot with your left foot, when your arms get sore, and when your sneakers leak. But always remember, you are a terp. A terp is a state of mind. It's a can-do attitude. Remember that the terrapin, that little creature that lives in the byways and waterways in the mid-Atlantic, has a very unique characteristic. That turtle can only walk forward, it cannot walk backwards. And how does that turtle walk forward? By taking one step at a time and sticking its neck out. That's what it means to be a turtle. It means Thinking big, aiming high, taking one step at a time, never giving up, never giving in, that's called moxie. That's called grit. That's called chutzpah. This is why generations of Terps live lives of accomplishment, commitment, and service. So back to Dr. Seuss. Will you succeed? Yes, you will indeed. 98 and 3 fourth percent guaranteed. That's because you've already succeeded. You graduated from the University of Maryland. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting. So get on your way. Class of 2017, God bless you and Godspeed. Please stand silently for the retiring of the colors by the University of Maryland Honor Guard.
Oh. 